if you've ever seen a video where I shelf something in my web browser, you've probably noticed that I have an absolute ton of extensions installed. Now, unlike my regular system where I have about 1500 packages installed, mainly because I'll test a piece of software in a video and then forget to uninstall it, all of the plugins I have inside my web browser are things that I actively use. Some of them I don't use daily, but I still use them frequently enough where I actually want to have it installed. So as of the recording of this video, I have 14 extensions installed, which might seem like a lot, but I've had more in the past. These are just the ones that I know that I actually need to have. Now, many of these extensions aren't open source, but the ones that are, I will point out. The reason why they're not is frankly because there's just not a lot of good open source alternatives for the things that I actually want to use. One of those being the first one, vidIQ. If you make YouTube videos, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't either have TubeBuddy or vidIQ installed. They both do basically the same things, but I prefer the interface for vidIQ. Basically what these tools do is take YouTube and make it so it actually provides metrics that someone making videos might actually want to see. So for example, I don't have to go to any of these videos to actually see the like to dislike ratio. And if I actually hover over one of these, it'll give me a bar as well, telling me the number of likes and the number of dislikes. But let's say we actually go into this video here and not play the ad. Wow, that's a different ad than we got before. Now, sometimes it doesn't actually load it properly, but off to the right hand side here, there we go. It's going to show things like the number of views you have. It's going to show you the thumbnail. It's going to show you a score of like how well it does in the SEO and all of these other metrics that YouTube just doesn't provide to you for anything. You can see where the channel is actually from, all of the channel metrics, the tags for the video, the channel tags even. And this isn't just for videos that other people upload. This is for videos that you upload as well. And you can also see some extra stuff on the actual creator studio as well. So one thing being that if you go and say, want to set some tags on a video, it'll suggest you tags that actually get used frequently with the other tags you're using. You can compare keywords, you can compare channels, you can get alerts when specific topics start trending. All of these things that YouTube should just have built into it this plugin basically gives you. Now, older versions of the Creative Studio did actually have things like this built in, but over time, they've just been stripped out. Honestly, I could do an entire video just on vidIQ, but we'll leave that for now and go on to the second one, which is Honey. Now, I'm sure everyone watching this video has come across Honey at some point, whether that be from like Linus Tech Tips or some other big channel like that, so I'll make this brief. Let's say we wanna go and buy some RGB strips, for example. So what Honey is going to let you do is when you go to the checkout, it's going to go and try out some discount codes automatically for you. And then if the discount codes work, then you'll save some money. That's pretty much what it does. It also has like a rewards program as well with its Honey Gold, but I don't really care about that. All I really care about is just potentially getting a discount. And while it doesn't work every single time, because maybe the shop doesn't actually have any discount codes available, when it does... There's no harm in saving some extra money. If I wanted to cut back on all of my plugins, this would be one of the few that I make sure that I still have. Next up is the Google Translate plugin. Now, I'm well aware that I could just, you know, go to the Google Translate website and translate something like that, but it is nice to have something just sitting right here. Whenever I just need to do some sanity checking, usually what I'm going to do is whenever I'm trying to like read some Japanese text and there's just something that isn't exactly clicking. I will usually just take that phrase, stick into Google Translate and work out if I'm getting myself in the right direction. Now, obviously Google Translate isn't going to be perfect when you're trying to do things like massive sentences, but usually for like single words, it's gonna be good enough to at least send you in the right direction. Or one of the things I still occasionally make mistakes on is reading katakana. So what I'll do is I'll just take that bit of katakana, I'll stick it into Google Translate, it'll translate it, and then I can just move about my day. I know there are plugins that are based on Argos Translate and Libra Translate and all of that sort of stuff, the open source translation frameworks that do exist. The problem though is the Japanese models for Argos Translate, Libra Translate, whatever you want to call it, are not very good as I demonstrated in my recent video. So for things like say Spanish and Portuguese and languages like that, it's perfectly fine. The Japanese model on the other hand, they are aware that it's a problem because their test data is 
only sentences and is not really sure how to handle single words. Next up is Bitwarden, and Bitwarden is open source, but not just the extension, also the back end as well. So if you don't know, Bitwarden is basically a password manager, very similar to something like, say, LastPass, for example. I used to use LastPass, and LastPass for quite a while was actually pretty good. One thing I didn't like about it, though, was the fact that all of the code was proprietary, you couldn't see any of the source code, and also now LastPass has completely ruined their free tier, making it so you're pretty much limited to one device. Bitwarden doesn't have this limitation, it still does have a paid tier, except in the case of Bitwarden, the free tier offers pretty much everything that most people will want to actually have from a password manager. The paid tier really only has things like YubiKey support for two-factor authentication, but the free tier does still have 2FA, just not YubiKey support. Also, the paid version has password health reports. It's not really a feature that I ever really care about, so for me, it sort of just acts as a donation. The people they actually charge are the corporate users of Bitwarden, so regular users get basically everything, and then they charge corporations to actually make their money. Now, Yomi-chan is a plugin that if you just look at the interface for it, it doesn't really look like it does much, but what it is, is a GPL licensed Japanese dictionary engine. So let's say I want to go and find out what this word right here is. So if I go and hold down shift and then go and highlight that, as we can see, it shows us a reading for it. So Chugoku, it shows us how we can actually pronounce it. It gives us the pitch accent. It shows us the actual meaning for it, as well as providing other potential meanings as well. This is a really, really useful plugin, and when you first install it, it doesn't actually do anything, because by default, it doesn't actually ship with any dictionaries. But over on the Yomichan website, there is a list of dictionaries you can go and download, and I have downloaded basically all of them. Some of them are things like common words, some of them are names, some of them are pitch accents, some of them are things like slang. They're all really useful to have, so I felt like it was best to just download all of them. The other thing you can do with this is if you go up to the plugin and then click on the search icon here, this is actually going to let you do a search rather than finding something on the page. So let's say we wanted to go and search for uh, my Nen, for example, so that's going to be every year, as we can see, every year, yearly, annually, as well as some other potential things that could be as well, like, for example, just looking at the first kanji in there, and seeing what my actually means, which in this case, it means every. Along with this, I have another Japanese-related plugin. This is IPA Furigana. What this basically does is inserts Furigana into any page that has Japanese text. Effectively, what that means is showing you how the kanji is actually read. So, Chugoku, Umi, so on and so forth. Now, sometimes it doesn't exactly know what to do, so I'm guessing the dictionary isn't as up to scratch as it could be, so... In those cases, it's just going to show an asterisk, but that's why we also have Yomi-chan there as well. So if we're not sure, we can then go and highlight that, and as we can see, that is Kagari, and the next one is going to be Kyoku. It's just useful to have them both there, because even if we do know how it's read, we may not exactly know what the meaning is anyway. That's all for the Japanese-related plugins, but another one we have is Dark Reader. What Dark Reader lets you do is basically force a dark mode on any website. Now, there is also an option to force a light mode. I don't know why you would do that, but it is an option there if you really want it. This is a really nice plugin to have just because most websites, frankly, don't have dark mode. A lot of them are starting to get them. I like them. I know there's questions of whether they're actually better for your eyes or not. I don't really care if they are or aren't. I just think that a dark mode website just frankly looks better. We also have some sliders in here to make some simple changes to the theme. So we can go and say, decrease the brightness, raise up the contrast, make this more sepia, make this more grayscale, things like this. But if you want to go and fully customize the theme, you can go and click on the dev tools down here, and this will actually let you modify everything that's being changed. There is a lot that's being changed, so good luck actually doing so, but it is an option here if you do want to mess with it. Now, this is also licensed under the MIT license, which is nice to see as well. Another MIT licensed extension I have is Surfing Keys. Now, Surfing Keys is very similar to another project by the name of Vimium. What they let you do is add in Vim keys and a more keyboard-driven workflow into your web browser. Now, adding more keyboard support to a web browser wouldn't be really that useful, but they add in a way that actually makes sense 
inside of a browser. So for example, if I go and press F, this is going to go and let me click on a link. So let's say I want to go and click on, I don't know, this one up here. As we can see, if I press T, that's going to go and do that. And that takes us to the page, along with doing things like adding in Vim key scrolling and a bunch of other nice things as well. I did a dedicated video on surfing keys. I think it is a little bit better than Vimium if you care about the extra features it adds. But if you don't, Vimium does basically everything you're going to want. Now, as for my ad blocker, tracker blocker, privacy protector, whatever term you want to use to describe it, Right now, I'm using uBlock Origin, which is licensed under the GPL3 and does everything you could possibly want a program like this to do, is incredibly lightweight, and I don't really see any reason to run anything else. You can go and customize exactly what you want to go and block. You can go and say block external fonts. You can go and block JavaScript. You can block media elements, things like this, and you have full control over that. It's not forcing you to block everything or block nothing. You can very easily go on whitelist pages as well. You can go and modify your filters. You can modify your rules. All of this stuff that a lot of the proprietary solutions don't actually let you do, and because they don't let you do it, things like uBlock and AdBlock Plus now, uBlock and uBlock Origin are different things. uBlock is the proprietary version. Those proprietary options all have an acceptable ads program, letting certain ads come through because they pay money for it to happen. uBlock Origin, because you have complete control, can't possibly do that. While it is fairly well configured out of the box, there are custom block lists you can go and download as well if you want to go and make sure it blocks even more stuff to the point where you're effectively breaking the web, doing things like blocking redirects and blocking things like AWS URLs and things like that, which I wouldn't recommend doing, but you can do it if you want to. Now, there are four more extensions here, but none of these are really that exciting. So we have the Tron Link extension, we have the Steam keychain, we have the Hive keychain, and also the BitTube Airtime extension as well. And what these are are just crypto wallets. And judging by the name of them, you can probably guess what is actually stored in them. So Tron Link has Tron, Steam Keychain has Steam, Hive Keychain has Hive, and then the BitTube Airtime extension is for BitTube. Usually I'm not a big fan of having any crypto stored in my web browser. I feel like it's a bit of a security vulnerability. But in the cases of these ones, I don't really have anything that valuable in there and also these integrate with these services on the websites that are related to them. Now all of these plugins are running inside of Brave and I haven't really noticed any problems with doing so. I know that some plugins don't exactly play nicely with it mainly because of the Brave shields but in this case it's not a problem. I do also have Chromium and Firefox installed as well but in those cases I just have portions of this list installed in those browsers. So for Chromium, I believe I have vidIQ and Bitwarden, and then Firefox is, I think, just Bitwarden, actually, because Firefox is just there if I need some extra browser to do some testing. So these have been the plugins that I run on my system, and let me know in the comment section down below what plugins you run yourself, if there's any overlap between what we have, or maybe some things that you think I should actually try out. Now, before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to... Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Will, Brennan, Chica, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter, the Steven, Tony, Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support me, click the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, Libra, pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere, and then this channel is available on Odyssey and BitChute if you'd like to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.